Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And we are now looking at the Bibliotheca Sacra, uh, an article by Dr. Sweeney on Jesus's Promise of the Spirit, lovely article, as the disciples wait, gathered in Jerusalem for Pentecost to fall upon them. Conservative or old school Protestants demur, saying Jesus sent the Spirit not to shape secular values, but to guide the first disciples as they wrote the New Testament. With the founding of the church and the closing of the canon, they contend God stopped short, stopped sharing new truths, and instead helped Christians understand what was written. Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and most other Christians stand somewhere in the middle of these two positions. Roman Catholics say that the Spirit still leads us into truths not codified before but only through the office of the Catholic Magisterium, composed of all bishops in communion with the Pope. The Orthodox affirm that the Spirit led the early Church Fathers in their work, superintending the results of the first seven ecumenical councils, but pausing this dogmatic work in 787 at Nicaea too, which restored the use and veneration of icons, a hallmark of Eastern Orthodoxy. <clears throat> in resuming it, perhaps at the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church held in Crete in 2016, a resumption still contested among the Orthodox faithful some of whom did not attend this Latter-day Council. Pentecostals are convinced that the Spirit has been poured out again anew in recent days. The last days inaugurated in the 19th century, at least according to most. But mainly enabled us to live according to Scripture and to hasten Christ's return with evangelistic power. And most other Protestants are somewhat less certain what to make of the leading of the Holy Spirit in the present. The majority believe that the Spirit still speaks, but they hesitate to separate that speech from scriptures. Word and Spirit work together, these Protestants aver. When the Spirit speaks anew, He appropriates the word, helping those with ears to hear, to understand, to obey, and make use of the Bible, and make in the best of church history to improvise responses to uniquely modern questions. We will flesh out these positions somewhat further in what follows. For now, what matters is that nearly all Christians owe the teaching of their church to the sending of the Holy Spirit. He steered the first Christians after the descent of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection, ascension, and session. He inspired the apostles as they wrote the New Testament, and he helped the church fathers and later doctors of the church and as they handed on faith, then entrusted to the saints. In these lectures, we will explore this history and debates that attend the task of sorting out the Spirit's work in scripture and tradition. Lest we lose ourselves in intramural controversy, however, let's remember that the Spirit is still at work in the world today wants to make good use of the history of our faith. Fascinating article.
Now for modern reformation, learning to read the scriptures like the church fathers by Dr. Craig Carter. In Europe, the neo-orthodox movement stemming from Karl Barth produced another version of biblical theology in which tensions were even more evident. Barth's theological exegesis was light years ahead of the historical critical exegesis of the late 19th century decadent Protestantism, precisely because it took theology of the biblical text seriously. But like Barth himself, European biblical theologians such as Oscar Coleman, Gerhard von Rod, and Walter Eichrott did not challenge head-on philosophic naturalism of the historical critics. Instead, they attempted to treat the biblical text theologically while accepting the assured results of decadent criticism on issues as dating authorship and unity of the biblical books. In his biblical theology in crisis, Brever Childs chronicled the internal tensions of the biblical theological movement. An impressive series of publications during the second half of the 20th century, Childs attempted to square the circle by bringing theological exegesis into his methodology without denying or revising historical criticism. Although judgments as to how successfully he held the two together vary, and interpreting scripture with a great tradition, I argue that he did not. His intentions were noble, but the same irreconcilable tensions that characterized European biblical theological movement continued to haunt his project. His emphasis on the importance of the canon for exegesis was in tension with the higher acceptance of higher criticism, in which the canon concept of canon was reduced to mere human tradition. How can a human tradition be the foundation of the meaning of scripture? Childs gives us no adequate answer to the question. What can the church fathers add or offer? Near the end of his life, Childs pointed us to a potential solution to the problem he never solved. In a book on the history of the interpretation of Isaiah, Childs surveyed figures from Justin Martyr to the present although over half of the book focuses on the patristic period. He clearly shows how patristic interpretation grew out of the New Testament interpretation of Isaiah, which is significant because it establishes continuity between the apostles and their immediate successors, the church fathers. He shows how key texts in Isaiah 7:14. Chapters 9, 11, and 53 were interpreted messianically by the fathers as they followed apostolic exegesis. If we can agree that the apostles not only provide an inspired and authoritative instance of how to interpret the Hebrew scriptures, but also an inspired and authoritative example of how to do so, then the fathers become a crucial case study for how we can and should follow the example of the apostles in reading scripture. As Childs discusses Origen, Irenaeus, Jerome, John Chrysostom, and Cyril of Alexandria, among others, patterns emerge that show how the fathers in read the scriptures in ways in which their approach differed from modern hermeneutics. Tempting as it is to discuss all the illuminating moves they made in their interpretation of Isaiah, I must restrain myself in the interests of space and urge you to read this crucial book for yourself.
As I read it, I became convinced that Childs has shown us the path ahead by pointing to the recovery of pre-modern exegesis as exemplified in the fathers. They were not only they were not only read to challenge pagan materialism, they were open to the divine author's voice in the text. We cannot overcome the deleterious effects of philosophic naturalism on hermeneutics unless we first recover the genius of pre-modern exegesis. By studying how the fathers read scripture in imitation of the apostles and then imitate the apostolic patristic method as we do our own exegesis. I will outline three key concepts that characterize pre-modern exegesis and briefly discuss them in how we interpret Isaiah 53. This should provide some idea of what it means to read scripture like the church father's wonderful article. Now for the Modern Reformation, the January-February edition. And we bring this to a close. The Narcissism of Fault of Small Differences by Mike Horton. Although they lived near each other along the border, the McCoys were in Kentucky and Hatfields in West Virginia. Their infamous feud began when Asa Harmon McCoy returned from fighting for the Union in the Civil War and was murdered by some Confederate thugs who called themselves the Wildcats. A prominent member of the Hatfield clan was suspected as the ringleader, though he was never arrested. It was not until 2003 that an official truce was declared, signed by 60 descendants. The McCoy-Hatfield feud has become a cliché for what Freud called the narcissism of small differences. There are countless examples in history of inhabitants who live close to borders, whether artificial or narrow, natural, asserting their identity more intensely than the rest of their compatriots. Taken to the extreme, patriotism, ethnicity, language, customs, or just about anything else can explode into a Manichaean vision of the final battle between darkness and light. There were socioeconomic differences as well. The Hatfields were wealthier and better connected than the McCoys but not so far apart that their daily lives did not intersect. At those intersections, superiority and resentment bred the narcissism of small differences. Group narcissism is seductive, especially when people feel like the folks in the next neighborhood over are threatening their future. We've created an instinct to identify with others because they are different interesting and challenge us to grow in ways we would wouldn't have if left on our own view but in our sinful condition the good instinct is warped and we'd prefer to be in our own silo with people who think look act eat feel and dream like us i need other people to justify me to assure me of my righteousness, and that even in my self-indulgence disguised as righteous indignation, I am not alone. <clears throat> European settlers in America were able to unite around the common cause of independence, the otherness of the old world with its failed civilization. Through kidnapping on a massive scale, they sought to form a permanent other whose very skin could be represented as encoding a difference that made them special. This is the narcissism of small differences, but differences nonetheless. A biblical doctrine of creation says that difference is God's good, true, and beautiful intention in creation of Eve. 
bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, very different yet one. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, Paul told the philosophers, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not very far from any one of us. Diversity from uni unity should lead us back to the ultimate unity who is simultaneously three persons. We can therefore never get back to unity that isn't also a communion of distinct persons. If we don't like difference, then we don't like God. Whatever he means by that article. Calvin Journal for more babble. A blabathon from Tony Bierma. A painful article with about, oh, regrettably, another 16 pages of pain. Obtain a yield, some practical things. This principle is in tension with principle. It insists on producing food and other products and therefore willingly compromises on ideals in order to harvest before longer range aspects of the system mature. Apply self-regulation and accept feedback. Permaculture is not a turnkey operation or simply letting nature be nature. Systems are iterated with experience through culling dysfunction, adjusting and reconfiguring, reinvesting in success, and so on. Uses and valuable renewable resources and services. Six, produce no waste. The principle has two elements. First, within the system as in nature, wastes such as manures are natural for carbon cycling and fertility. Reduce wastes, single-use plastics. Design from patterns to details. Incorporate large system patterns, road access, water flow, dwellings, before adding smaller elements such as trees, which may be painful to remove or replant later if poor design requires major adjustment. And we thankfully put him down and turn to Westminster Magazine. And the Fear of God by Dr. Mark Garcia. The world that trades in fear. The summer 2017 of Lapham's Quarterly was dedicated to fear. Fear said Lewis Lapham is America's top selling consumer product. Lapham, Lapham's, Lapham's remark is disconcerting, not only because we all have fears and are uneasy with that reminders of our vulnerability to them, but also because he reminds us that one person's fear is too often another person's opportunity, because the fearful are desperate not to be afraid that desperation can be taken advantage of. And that too is something we fear. The truth is that fear pays. And as human beings, we have proven unable to resist anything that pays. In scripture, we learn that trading on our fears is in fact an ancient strategy of the enemy for loosening our ties to God in order to permanently enslave us. What then protects the child of God from the profound vulnerabilities of fear and from the exploitation of others? It may sound ironic, but the answer to fear is fear, the fear of God. Fear in God liberates us from the fear of anyone or anything other than God. In our day, fear is not only America's top-selling product, 
It is apparently our diet as well. Through social media, news outlets, and opinion pieces, we feed on fear. We metabolize our fears into a range of debilitating expressions. Sociologists, cultural commentators, educators, and ministers have noted for years how contemporary teens and adults seem unusually shackled by fear, by apathy concerning the future, by anxieties in relationships, and by a deep running insecurity resulting in the ability, inability to receive formative correction. It is though we presently inhabit a reverse image of the moral and covenantal world at work in the book of Proverbs, in which the fear of the Lord is a key theme and the fear of man is persistently warned against. In the world of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is cultivated not in isolation, but through communal instruction and corrective discipline in ordered relations at home and society and with sober acknowledgement of the dangers as well as promises attached to industry, domestic, and civil relationships. And our relation to the Torah, the fear of the Lord is thus the beginning of wisdom, the wisdom that takes shape in concrete ethical contexts of one's life. The well-ordered and godly life begins with the fear of the Lord as its point of departure for secular living. Very nice, very wise, very godly. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. That was worth the read. Now we turn to a book in Anglican Episcopal history. A book review of church and estate, wealth, and religion in industrial Philadelphia. He started talking about uh, George Roberts in 1886 as he's building a church. The outlines of the St. Asaph story could well serve as a paradigm narrative for Thomas Resnick's well-searched and presented study of the relationship between wealth and religion for individuals in Philadelphia through the last decades of the 19th century towards the end of the 1920s. From a Quaker family, the now Episcopalian George Roberts Viewing St. Asaph's, there's a lot of Quakers in Philadelphia who became Episcopalians. <clears throat> the development of the surrounding neighborhood and exercising what Res Resnick styles pri pri privatistic logic successfully maneuvered the building of this church through what proved to be a minimum of diocesan difficulties. When several nearby parishes objected that St. Asaph's was both unnecessary and would draw away parishioners, the money and influence of Roberts and those now joined with him rather easily won out. In examining the changing religious beliefs and practices of Philadelphia's elite shape their class identity, while their financial weight strongly influenced the structures and religious and social life in Philadelphia during these 50 or so years. Resnick takes into consideration other Protestant groups, particularly Presbyterians. He looks at the same economic, cultural, socio, social, and theological currents at work among Roman Catholics and Jews with important fluxes of differences resulting from their various cultures and forms of governance. The main players are, however, Episcopalians. In his chapter, the Quaker turned the Episcopal gentry and the Episcopal ascendancy. Resnick describes how they came to regard themselves as the religious establishment. 
Among the strengths of the study are the scholar's refusal to reduce his story of changes taking place to economics and matters of social status. These are human stories in which the power of wealth and the seeking of spiritual capital and prestige and influence were ever operative, but where sincere spiritual yearnings and a genuine desire for sound teachings, meaningful worship and spiritual fulfillment also had their roles. Very nice article. We turn to Westminster Journal, an article by Dr. Hibbs on what's in a word, the Trinity. The divine roots of language, a speaking God. To establish this answer, we must begin by understanding something of the nature of God himself. Eugene Rogenstock QC once wrote that the, the name God means he who speaks, he who enthuses man so that man speaketh the origin of speech. The de definition of God might seem too broad or simplistic, but I believe it is biblically informed. The very first thing we learn about God in scripture is that he creates through speech, Genesis 1. Theologians past and present have noted that this communicative nature of God is one of his most striking com com traits. Douglas Kelly remarks in his book, The God Who Is the Holy Trinity, Volume 1, Systematic Theology, Grounded in Holy Scripture and Understood in the Light of the church 2008 the true god is not silent he talks reflecting on augustine's work lewis ayres writes from eternity god speaks his word the word in whom he determines all that will be john frame has even advocated that we treat speech as an essential attribute of god and I would incur, uh, concur. God is one who speaks both to himself in three persons. In human language that goes beyond our human comprehension. And to his creatures. We can conclude with Kevin Van Hooser. Christian orthodoxy believes that God is essentially the one. Who communicates himself to others in Trinitarian fashion. And that is a potent article that we will have to digest. Now for Mid-America Journal and some talking about Bart's belches and burpings about historical federal theology. To counter Bart's charge, classic Reformed theologians need only dispute Bart's take on the Word of God and Scripture as they witness to the Word of God. Word of God being God's past, present, and future saving activity. That is the short answer to dispute Bart's definition of revelation. That revelation is to be defined only as God's actually and effectually to reveal himself at a given time and place to specific people or a specific person. Neither the Reformed Orthodox nor federal writers denied that without divine illumination, the message of the Bible cannot find purchase in human hearts. Without the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit working in tandem with the scriptures, revelation is without salvific or sanctifying effect. In that sense, given the necessity of divine illumination that it accompanies scripture for its message to have a saving effect on the human heart, the classic reform position can agree that the Bible does not directly convey its benefits, ipso facto.
Furthermore, classic and federal writers, reformed writers, hardly think of scripture and certainly not the illuminating work of the spirit in the human heart as a commodity, which humans can commandeer by an act of will and wield effectually to bless those whose ears hear its message. God remains God. Indeed, only God can reveal God, and he does. But divine revelation has a texture of meaning, salvific and non-salvific. That said, scripture does directly convey to all hearers of it the word of God, understood as the divine message conveyed in words to human ears. Such can be the case without saving effect. This tracks with scripture itself. Even Bart does not deny, but strongly affirms that humans elect in Christ resist and deny and live contrary to that definitive reality about themselves. Such persons sin against grace. They harden themselves against the good news of salvation. They reject Christ and thereby live in unreality. But what, we may ask, are they rejecting? Gospel? Yes. Christ? Yes. And is Christ somehow as presented to us in the pages of the Bible, the scriptural witness, no longer the word of God, the word in the flesh? In other words, contrary to Bart's view, scripture allows for and requires a form of divine revelation out of scripture as word of God that does not necessitate a blessed efficacy Revelation need not be defined solely to its salvific efficacy of God's saving activity. Revelation and the word of God can be revelatory of God even when it does not find purchase in the human heart. Given that, the charge of historicism against federal theology seems relatively wide of the mark for gaining information about God's relationship to sinners in the way of the covenant, as recorded on the pages of the Old Testament, hardly dismisses the utter requisite of God's miraculous intervention to illumine the human heart and to effect a redemptive blessing. What is more, as for using the narrative of covenant history as presented in the Old Testament, to reach conclusions about the saving scope of God's grace in Jesus Christ. The scriptural witness does that very thing. Bart's open-ended gospel paradigm will be addressed below. At this point, suffice it to say that his revised paradigm cannot be traced along the lines of scripture. As for the accusation that federal theology, in its embrace of classic reform conception of predestination, gave in to historical metaphysics, this will be taken up under the third point, so we will forego addressing the allegation later. Carl Bart. Now for the Churchman, the winter issue 2018, talking about Joel and Obadiah. I was particularly grateful for Jones' determination to read the prophets in light of the Mosaic Covenant. The creational themes of Joel, for example, were not primarily read as generic comments about care of the earth but as particular expression of Deuteronomic curses and blessings. That said, I would have benefited from a slightly fuller consideration of the books from a biblical theological perspective. The Focus Commentary series is to be commended for its desire to be readable, reliant, and relevant. But the third R must be built upon the right understanding of the believer's relationship to these books. This was not always as transparent as could have been.
the potential weakness means that the discussion questions would need to be handled with care. Could people have visions today? Could be an explosive question for a home group to handle without extra support. Jones serves his readers well by identifying features of the text which could easily be missed. These include both what is their Hebrew wordplay, which are inevitably lost in translation, and what is not there. He also frequently identifies other Old Testament references which are related to the details of Joel and Obadiah. However, at the times there is lack of sharpness. In conclusion, a helpful resource for the keen Christian who wants to get in a couple of obscure parts of the Bible, perhaps in their quiet times, to a home group leader preparing for a series of Bible studies. Three, a preacher who wants to become familiar with the books before turning to more detailed commentaries. We will bring that to an end as we turn to global Anglicanism. <clears throat> we start a new article, Beyond Male and Female, How Redemption's Relationship to Creation Shapes Sexual Ethics by Sam Ashton. This article is the winner of 2021 Global Anglican Essay and was highly commended by the judges, Bishop Samuel Morrison in Chile, Reverend Shady Annis in Egypt, and Dr. Lee Gaddis, UK, and Dr. Martin Ford of Singapore. This article, article contributes to current debates about issues of sexuality, by exploring the dogmatic locus of redemption relates to creation, specifically sexed embodiment. How does the redemptive work relate to the male and female of the creation event? Megan DeFranza has recently proposed the biblical category of eunuch as a placeholder for intersexuality, discerning a biblical trajectory where in Christ eunuchs supplement the male-female binary of creation. Thus, redemption expands creation, such as sexual dimorphism becomes sexual polymorphism. In response, this article engages Isaiah 56 and Matthew 19 to maintain this redemptive development of creation concerns spiritual and social inclusion rather than the expansion of sexual structures. Footnote. See the 2018 Theological Working Group papers that contributed towards the House of Bishops in the Church of England. In this article, creation refers to the prelapsarian dispensation and dogmatic locus of Genesis 1 and 2. <clears throat> My use of redemption assumes the historical distinction between a comp redemption accomplished and applied now at Christ's first coming. Recent debates about the issues of sexuality are often in un underpinned by the question of how redemption relates to creation. More specifically, how does the redemptive work relate to the male and female of the creation event? We'll pick that up later. We now turn our attention to the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Journal of 1837, and the editor here is discussing his own role as an editor. Besides, every reader expects variety in a periodical publication. It's gratifying and encouraging to be able to announce that several have 
promised their contributions statedly, and others have given their promises to help. The necessity and advantage of preparing with great care the communications intended for insertion are very respectfully intimated. The number of families into which this work will be received is greater than the number of individuals that ordinarily wait on one man's instructions in the sanctuary. With what care, then, should a word in season be prepared when several members of these households and others, from the aged disciple to the youthful pupil in the school of Christ, from the man of full age requiring strong meat of the word to the babe, needing sincere milk are at once to have access that may be furnished by this monthly messenger. Besides, should they be found deserving, parts at least may claim the attention of some whose eye may meet them in coming years. Let the opportunity of making a present exhibition of the testimony and of its recording for succeeding generation be improved carefully. In conclusion, the work is commended to God, whose blessing alone can render it useful in answering the end for which it has been undertaken. It is presented to the Christian public, claiming a humble rank among the journals of the present day, under a belief that, numerous and diversified as they are, there is room for another whose object is the advancement of the glory of God and of his cause and covenant. Now we turn to another article, The True Christian Characterized. Many millions of men in pagan and Mahometan nations are without God and without hope in this world. They are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and from the covenants of promise. They know nothing of the Christian system and are utterly ignorant of Christ, its author. They cannot in any sense claim the name of Christian. And though some without authority from either scripture or reason have maintained that the less grossly immoral and more orderly and intelligent among them may be saved, yet none has ventured to call them Christians. And seeking after the characteristics of the true Christian, they are left out of the inquiry. We will turn next to the Princeton Theological Journal. We continue to get the book review of Robinson's Gesenius. It is not to be supposed that Dr. Robinson's literary enterprise and industry will long remain inactive after publication of his Greek and Hebrew lexicons. We have heard it stated that his next work is to be an extensive one on biblical geography. He could not perhaps do the public better service than by carrying this design into immediate execution. It must, however, be the work of years, and in the meantime, we would venture to suggest an undertaking which would probably be profitable to himself and others, and what and would call for scarcely any laborious action. What we have in view is the exact translation of the smaller Hebrew grammar of Gesenius. The last two editions of that work exhibit it in a much improved and augmented state. And the majority of voices seem to hail it as the best elementary work extant. Whether it be so or not, it is desirable that the American student should have access, if he wishes, to the unadulterated writings of the most distinguished Hebraist now living. And Gesenius himself, we have no doubt, would be pleased to see his grammar given to America and England, as his lexicon has been, in a faithful version and handsome form, without mutilation, deprivation, or distortion, 
his satisfaction in that case would be greater from the fact that such a revision of his grammar could scarcely, if at all, affect the sale of the original. Whereas it is no less curious than certain that Robinson's Gesenius and Gesenius's Gesenius are actually rivals, not in a literary but a commercial sense. The lexicon manuale was, of course, prepared not for the German, but for the foreign market, with special reference to England and America. In this translation, it uh, is a rival work, which would not be the case with the translation of the grammar, as the latter has never yet appeared in Latin dress. Until it does appear in some more accessible form, the great majority of our biblical students cannot fully appreciate the author's work in comparison with Ewald, whose grammar has already been translated into English. And our next article will be a plea for voluntary societies and defense of the decisions of the General Assembly of 1836 against the strictures of Princeton reviewers and others. We'll pick that up next time. We turn now to Princeton Theological Review, and uh, it's a book review on redeeming gender. Here we go. Thatcher's attempt to do better is the most exciting aspect of redeeming gender. In a creative application of orthodoxy, Thatcher makes three claims. The first is that the opening chapter of Genesis teaches the creation of a single humankind, not male kind and female kind. The image of God is located in humankind not reflected through complementary combinations of men and women. Thatcher also notes that there is no essence to women and men except in their human nature. Orthodox Christology informs us following sin and God's response to it in Christ. It is Christ who is the image of God. Thus, and secondly, Christ is the image and essence of humankind. Through Christology, Thatcher moves us beyond theologically endorsed gender essentialism and its resultant hierarchies. Yet those readers who claim any politicized identity may well be suspicious. Is this proposal a form of theological identity erasure? A violence so often perpetrated against those of subjugated identity groups? To this question, Thatcher responds in the negative. Difference remains in Christ's renewed humanity and becomes a means of communion, communion 178. Here, Thatcher illustrates how the life of the Trinity illuminates for human, humankind the redeemed dynamic of identity difference. The redeemed life offered by the gospel is life in communion with God as God's life is in communion. Thatcher finds the meaning of communion in the Athanasian Creed. Its insistence that persons are one, yet that each have strong identity means that each person's individuality is not actualized at the expense of others. Nor must the problem be dealt with by erasure or domination, because each person is the one life that pours itself out into self-giving love. This is the communion into which Christians are drawn. Redeeming gender is a creative, orthodox, and sustainable theology of gender. Readers may find it strange that transgender, non-binary, and intersex people enjoy only a limited presence in the work. However, this is due to Thatcher's aim to deconstruct the problem beyond our, behind our gender troubles, the gender essentialism which underpins the two-sex theory.
In doing so, Thatcher has delivered on his promise to produce a theological approach to gender as a single continuum which adequately resists oppressive gender hierarchies while valuing identity and difference. Michael Cronin, M. Div Midler. The next article will be a book review of Benjamin Connors' Disabling Mission, Enabling Witness, Exploring Missiology Through the Lens of Disability Studies. We now turn to Concordia Theological Journal and a discussion of Scott McKnight's volume. In two key chapters, McKnight opens the biblical perspective on infant baptism. This is undeniably the strongest and most helpful chapters in his book. He begins chapter four by saying, as a Bible professor, I believe our theology and our practice ought to be established by the Bible an approach I wish he had used to structure the book. He sets out three major themes, union with Christ, spirit and church reception, and redemption. Curiously, he begins with Romans 10, 9 and 10, but then goes on to Matthew 28 and Acts 2, 38, 8, 16, 10, 48, and 19, 15, followed by Romans 6, 1 to 14, and Colossians 2, 6 through 15, concluding that baptism is an act in which God brings us into union with Christ and all the blessings Christ has accomplished. He returns to several more biblical texts, again, Acts 2, 38, 22, 16, Galatians 3.27, 1 Corinthians 6.11, Romans 6, 4 through 8, Titus 3.5, Hebrews 10.22, 1 Peter 3.21, but for some reason omits John 3. He ends this chapter with five major terms defining what happens at baptism for our redemption. Sign, seal, symbol, sacrament, and seed, but misses many of the promises Lutherans associate with baptism. In chapter 5, McKnight explores in more detail his biblical understanding of the importance of infant baptism through a study of the word household in Acts and early Christian writers. He continues with an emphasis on covenant theology as related to circumcision and baptism. Concluding his presentation with a return to Anglican liturgy, McKnight describes the act of baptism, chapter 6, and his own personal testimony, chapter 7. These shorter chapters cover the actual act of baptizing, which McKnight sees as symbolically important. The Bible's emphasis is a whole body spirituality and a whole creation redemption, and a building base, utensil shaped, and ritual ordered worship in the temple. Referring to Peter's connection of baptism to Noah. <clears throat> McKnight is apparently unaware of Martin Luther's flood prayer, only referencing the Book of Common Prayer's prayer, affirming that Baptiste Zane does not require immersion. McKnight does appreciate the practice of the use of oil for chrismation. His concluding personal testimony includes an unfortunate quote from two Anglican theologians, Stott and Motyer regarding baptism, that the reception <clears throat> of the sign, although it entitles them to the gift, does not confer the gift on them. This seems to be a denial of baptism's regenerative power, Titus 3. The book ends with an afterword by Gerald McDermott, who was a Baptist, but also came to Anglicanism. McDermott draws on G, John 3, 5, and Titus 3, 5 as support for his conversion to infant baptism. <clears throat>
we will pick this up. Dr. Timothy Mashke's review. He turned to Southwestern Theological Journal and the exegetical techniques employed in Hebrews. Despite some overlap between exegetical techniques and hermeneutical assumptions, exegetical techniques refer to the methods the author of Hebrews used to appropriate the Old Testament and structure his interpretation of it. Whereas hermeneutical assumptions refer to the interpretive framework by which the author understands God's final speech in the Son and implies the implications to, of this to his audience. I will discuss some hermeneutical assumptions in the final section of this article. Here the focus will be on exegetical techniques, illusions and echoes, numerous often undefined terms such as illusion, echo and reference are used to describe the appropriation of an earlier text by a later one that does not involve a direct citation. George Guthrie helpfully notes that an illusion involves an overt weaving of at least a phrase from an antecedent text into the author's own language without a formal marking of that language as set apart from the author's own words with morphological changes to words in the original quotation. He then points to Hebrews 1.13 as an example of a quotation with an introductory formula <coughs> of Psalm 110.1 from the Septuagint, whereas the prepositional phrase at the right and dexia, altering dexion from the source text without the introductory formula. We will pick that up next time. As we turn to the article on justification of the ordained office of deacon restricted to qualified males, there's one more linguistic oddity in the diacon word group. The noun diaconos is the same, whether referring to a male or a female servant. As to gender, context normally makes it clear. To ensure a reference to a feminine servant, the writer may add the feminine article, hey, or the feminine participle, usa, Romans 16, 1. In sum, the diacon word group is used in the New Testament with the general meaning of service or ministry. It is wonderfully connected in many verses to leadership, a servant leader, including our Lord. Also, all Christians are to consider their life as serving Christ and others. Finally, there's in many verses an emphasis on literally serving, especially at meals and aiding others' physical needs. In the above discussion, I have purposefully bracketed out the deacon-related verses more pertinent to this justification. Exegesis of specific deacon-related biblical passages. Which biblical verses are pertinent to this study? For the office and qualifications pertaining to the office of deacon, the form of Government 5.4 references 1 Timothy 3.8-13. The ARPC Directory of Public Worship 7a in a discussion of ordinations and installations notes that Christ has given deacons to serve and references Acts 6 1 to 6, Philippians 1 1, and 1 Timothy 3 8 through 13. These three texts are primary ones in any general discussion related to the office of deacon and are listed specifically in the ARPC standards. Why these three? Philippians 1.1 1, 1 and 1 Timothy 3.8-13 are the only two texts that clearly use the noun diakonos in the technical sense as deacon. 
Acts 6, 1 through 6, while using the verb diakoneo, and the abstract noun diakonia is considered the founding of the office of deacon. Of these three, only Acts 6 provides much information as to the function of the diaconate. To round out our understanding of the office and its functions, in addition to our specific question about women, other texts need to be considered. They include Romans 12, 7 and 8, 16, 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 1 Timothy 2, 12 and 5, 13 to 16. And now we turn to the Protestant Reformed Theological Journal and their issues with common grace and neo kuyperians History marched on from 1924 and continues to demonstrate time and again that the doctrine of the antithesis cannot survive the assault of common grace. When triumph is the expected end and one's allies in achieving this temporal vision are the unbelieving world, the antithesis is doomed. What is accepted as successful within the paradigm of common grace can never conform to the blessedness described by the Lord Jesus during his ministry, especially the Sermon on the Mount. Temporal definitions of success framed in secular terms will always be devoid of lasting theological significance based on biblical standards. Any institution that defines its success by the same criteria as its unbelieving allies will not endure the scorn of the world. It will not suffer for righteousness's sake. It will not sacrifice reputation for the cause of Christ. The reform principle of spiritual antithesis must be discarded for the neo kuyperian worldview to succeed. What is therefore left as the doctrinal foundation for the neo kuyperian movement is naked, uninhibited common grace. It ought to be no surprise, then, that the full trajectory of neo kuyperianism described above has progressed most rapidly in circles where a mature and all-encompassing doctrine of common grace is articulated. In such a system of all the theological safeguards that Kuyper set forth are blurred to the point of being lost. It should be no surprise that the traditional reform doctrine of scripture is an early casualty in the neo kuyperian circles, where the input of secular unbelieving allies must needs be equally revelatory as the words of scripture. Furthermore, one cannot risk alienating these allies on the basis of God's word. And so the line between common and particular grace becomes blurred. Within full-throated neo kuyperianism all that is left is grace, and not grace as divine power to effect changes in the hearts of depraved humanity, but grace as favor for all mankind without distinction, gifts and blessings for all without differentiation. If any doubt this trajectory in theology, I would challenge them to visit a reformed institution of higher learning and ask three questions of faculty and students. What does the antithesis mean? Two, is the Bible the inspired word of God? Three, whom does God love? The answers will be telling. Common grace has won the day at every level, starting with practice, followed by piety, and terminating in theology. Every part of the Reformed life has indeed been transformed by the neo kuyperian movement. We'll pick this up next time.
now for Thamelios and talking about Christ and Leviticus. The connecting sections. Having delineated the sections of Leviticus, the second stage of our approach is to explain how they relate to each other. Recognizing the centrality of the Day of Atonement, Morales and others have suggested that the entire book is structured as a chiasm, with chapter 16 acting as the fulcrum between the two halves of the book. Unfortunately, this leads to grouping sections too coarsely in order to make them fit the structure. For example, Morales groups chapter 23 to 27 and pairs them with chapters 1 to 7. But we've already seen that markers in the text suggest that chapters 23 to 27 should be understood as four distinct sections rather than one. Nevertheless, the importance of atonement and the possibility of chiastic patterns should not be dismissed. Louis Morales, Who Shall Ascend the Mountain of the Lord, A Biblical Theology of the Book of Leviticus Downers Grove, 2015. In addition to giving his own proposal for the structure of Leviticus, Morales discusses other proposals that also recognize the centrality of the Day of Atonement. If we consider the sections as already identified, we find uh, is the book is structured as a pair of chiasms rather than one, first spanning sections 1 through 8, chapters 1 to 22. And the second spanning sections 9 through 12, chapters 23 to 27. Starting with the first chiasm, we can see that sections 1 and 8 deal with offerings that are offered and are addressed to both priests and laity, while both sections 2 and 7 deal with the priesthood itself. Continuing this pattern, both sections 3 and 6 deal with the purity of Israel. Although section 6 contains the famous command to be holy in light of God's holiness, we classify this section as purity because the primary way Israel remains holy through these laws is by maintaining their cleanness. God separates Israel from the nations to live in his holy presence, to which the proper response is not defiling or profaning anything with the uncleanness of the nations. We turn now to the Journal of Theological Studies, 1908, and the editor is giving his introductory lecture. To the careful student of nature, on the other hand, Science gives a body of carefully built up truth, which is verifiable in all its details. While religion seems to rest on personal impressions, which may be very vivid, but yet mistaken. The whole tone and atmosphere is so different in the two spheres of thought that we cannot take either one or the other as a type of truth and the standard of truth which we will apply all around. He's dealing with science and religion here. It is not possible to reassure any earnest man by this platitude about the identity of religious and scientific truth. This identification may be looked for as an ultimate result, but we need guidance in a world where our scientific knowledge is incomplete and our religious knowledge is partial. We may, however, get one step forward if we note one reason for the difference between religious belief and scientific statement is the fact that they start at opposite poles. Science begins with the particular, with observation and generalization, and seeks for the universal. Our religion begins with the universal, one God, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and seeks to recognize the universal element 
the divine purpose in all the particular incidents. The two approach the problem of the universe and the explanation of it from very opposite sides. And so they seem to lie in different planes. They do not fit together until uh, they appear at all events to be mutually inconsistent. Not only are there three different aspects, but neither aspect is fully apprehended so far as our intelligence is concerned. We need not be surprised at the difficulty we feel in combining the two sides accurately. All we can hope to do is recognize the difference between the two modes of thought. We may perhaps find that just because they are so different, they serve to supplement one another. Even at the risk of some repetition, it may be worthwhile to point the contrast with the habit of mind I deprecate more definitely. In the 18th and early part of the 19th centuries, the differences were minimized and overlooked. There was a tendency to blend science and religion by using, as far as possible, common terms and bringing them under common ideas. We can now see that such attempts at forming an amalgam were premature and did not do justice either to science or to religion. We draw this edition of Theological Journals to a close. If God be for us, who can be against us? Godspeed.